Strange and Scary Mysteries of the Month, November 2021. Strange and Scary Mysteries of the Month is a compilation of the weird, disturbing, and downright baffling stories currently happening in our world. From UFOs to serial killers, ancient sites, mysterious creatures, and even ghosts, these are the Strange and Scary Mysteries of the Month for November 2021. Number 5. Four Murders from 1997 What does it take exactly to be called a serial killer? The FBI says that a murderer who kills at least three people within a year can be considered one, and in this story, we'll know the reason why William Reese has more than deserves such infamy. Reese was just 28 years old when he was convicted of kidnapping and assaulting his first known victim back in 1987. Following his release from jail, he struck once again, stalking and raping a woman from Oklahoma. This time he got 10 years in jail for this offense, and eventually got out in 1996. Then, just a year later, on April 3, 1997, a girl named Laura Smither disappeared from her hometown in Friendswood, Texas. 17 days later, the body of a 12-year-old was found 12 miles away from where she had vanished, and Reese was identified as a prime suspect, but he was never charged. Then in May of that same year, the Texan abducted Sandra Sapaw. The 19-year-old testified to being held against her will by the perpetrator. She narrowly escaped by leaping from her kidnapper's truck, and this case eventually locked Reese up for good. However, it took authorities five months before they were able to arrest the man, and within those months, Reese continued to commit some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. On July 15th, a woman named Kelly Cox went missing after she and her class from the University of North Texas went on a tour in Denton. After that, she was never seen again. Ten days following this incident, a newlywed woman named Tiffany Johnston was raped and murdered after she was kidnapped from a car wash in Bethany, Oklahoma. The next month, on August 17th, a senior in high school, Jessica Kane, disappeared while she was on her way to her Galveston County home. It has to be noted that throughout this period, authorities were on high alert and were investigating each of the disappearance cases. And it was in October of 1997 when Reese was finally captured for Sapa's abduction. He was sentenced to 60 years in jail for this conviction and is currently serving it. Meanwhile, the police continued to suspect him as the one who killed Smither, Johnston, Cox, and Kane. A big break then came in 2016 when forensics took hold of the evidence gathered on the Johnson case. Having matched the DNA profile found at the crime scene, Reese was now connected to the woman's murder. In that same year, he began to confess to Texas authorities about his murder spree back in 1997. And to bring weight to his words, he even led law enforcers to the sites where he buried Cox and Keynes' remains. With all this evidence and circumstances stacked up against him, 61-year-old Reese was charged and found guilty in the killings of Johnston, Kane, Cox, and Smither. An Oklahoma County District Judge gave the inmate a death sentence for the murder of Johnston. He is expected to receive equally harrowing punishments in Texas, where he will stand trial for the three other cases. For over a four-month span, Reese left a trail of terror that will forever be etched in crime's history as one of the worst. We can only be thankful that he was apprehended early. Had it not been so, he would have done more horrifying things and most certainly claimed even more lives. Number 4 1974 Valentine's Dance Court trials can be a very tricky thing. If the defendant finds that the evidence against him is solid and there is a big chance of him being found guilty after the trial, then they are advised to take a guilty plea at an early stage. If they do this, the accused will get to receive some kind of an incentive from the criminal justice system. 
1974, a teenager named Carla Walker and her boyfriend were spending a romantic Valentine's date at a parking lot in Fort Worth, Texas. All of a sudden, a stranger appeared. He pointed a gun at the couple, then hit the young man in the head, leaving him unconscious, and when he woke up, his girlfriend was gone. Three days later, Walker's body was found in a ditch near Lake Benbrook in Tarrant County. Investigators confirmed that the victim was beaten, raped, and tortured for days before she was killed eventually by strangulation. Texas police were also able to recover traces of semen on the woman's clothing and bra. The samples were sent to a lab for analysis, but considering the limited DNA technology at the time, they weren't able to come up with anything substantial. Meanwhile, material evidence pointed to a man named Glenn McCurley. He became a person of interest during the investigation for owning the same type of weapon believed to have been used by the perpetrator. McCurley, a truck driver, provided an alibi that threw the cops off his trail, and then the case went cold for almost 50 years. Had it not been for the development in forensic science, Walker's death would have remained unsolved. But in 2019, a new group of investigators from the Fort Worth Police Department decided to submit the old DNA evidence to forensic laboratories for analysis. There, they found McCurley as a possible match to the suspect's DNA profile. It would then take another year before they could fully establish his link to the crime. By doing so, they were able to arrest and detain the now 77-year-old suspect and put him in a Tarrant County jail where he awaited his trial. And during this time, the man insisted on his innocence. But then came October of 2021, where he was scheduled to face trial for his crime. After just two days in the proceedings, the man from Texas finally admitted to raping and killing Walker after the Valentine's Day dance back in 1974. He changed his plea from not guilty to guilty, and he was consequently sentenced to life in jail. McCurley's sudden guilty plea probably came both as a big surprise and relief to the family, loved ones, and friends of Walker. It was a long time coming, but... At least they now get the closure that they deserve. Number 3. The Tragedies of the Murdaugh Family Never had the state of South Carolina seen such a powerful legal family as the Murdaugh family. From 1920 all the way to 2006, three members of this clan had served consecutively as solicitor or chief law officer in the state's 14th Circuit District. The extent of their legal influence in these five counties brought about the term Murdoch country. But, as we always say, with great power comes great responsibility. And in their case, it also came with public scrutiny and criticism. Paul Murdaugh was only 19 when he took his friends on a boating trip in February of 2019. He was the great-great-grandson of Randolph Murdaugh Sr., the family's great ancestor. A police report said that Paul's boat crashed into a bridge and killed a friend named Mallory Beach. The teenager was then charged with a felony, but, much to everyone's bewilderment, he was not taken to jail for booking, nor was he ever handcuffed. This led people to speculate that the Murdaugh kid might have received special treatment and it didn't take long for Paul to get freed on bail. But this was just the start of the family's apparent problems. On June 7, 2021, Paul's father, Richard Alexander, often called Alex, drove up to their hunting lodge in Icelandton, South Carolina. What Alex found was his son and wife Maggie dead near the dog kennels, and the police report said that the two were shot multiple times. Interestingly, the adult Murdaugh was considered a person of interest to the double murder. His brothers John and Randy protested against this accusation. However, the current 14th District solicitor, who also happened to be tied to the family, recused himself from the investigation, leaving it unresolved as of the time being. 
The intrigue took yet another turn when Alex himself was shot in the head but not killed on September 4, 2021. And the plot further thickened when 10 days after that incident, he admitted to having orchestrated his own assassination attempt. His legal counsel explained that Alex became depressed over the deaths of his wife and son and he decided to hire a hitman to kill him. He thought that by doing so, his other son, Buster, would be guaranteed to receive his $10 million life insurance policy payout. On September 16th, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, announced Alex's arrest on charges of insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, and filing a false police report. Maggie and Paul's death, as well as Alex's fake shooting, were just but the start of the family's further decline. Shortly after the double murder incident, SLED said that they are looking into the case of Stephen Smith, who was killed in a hit-and-run incident. Smith's parents believe the Murdaws may have had something to do with the death of their son, who was openly gay. Also taking their chance at justice is the family of Gloria Satterfield, Satterfield was employed by the Murdaws as a housekeeper. In February of 2018, the 57-year-old was pronounced dead after she reportedly tripped and fell while working. However, SLED found out that the county coroner didn't perform an autopsy on the body. Alex Murdaugh is currently detained by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement after his arrest on October 14, 2021. And this came following his release from a drug rehabilitation facility in Orlando. Full of twists and intrigue, it wouldn't come as a surprise if HBO were to decide to make a documentary series based on the perplexing events surrounding the powerful Murdaugh family. Number 2. Martinsville 7 While many of us would say that what happened has already occurred and there's just no way to correct it, but some believe otherwise. As for the Virginia state government, they seem to think it's never too late to right the wrongs of the past. In 1949, seven African-American men from Martinsville, Virginia, were arrested and indicted for the alleged rape of a 32-year-old white woman named Ruby Floyd. Floyd told investigators at the time that she had been raped by 13 black men. The police quickly rounded up two suspects, Frank Hairston Jr. and Booker Milner. Four others were then arrested on the same night of January 8, 1949. They were Howard Hairston, his brother, James Luther, John Taylor, and Francis Grayson. By the next morning, all six men had already signed a written confession of their supposed crime, and the seventh man, Joe Hampton, was arrested just a day later. The court records revealed that some of the men had admitted to having sexual intercourse with the victim, however they claimed they were too drunk to remember the details. Law enforcers decided to separate the men in order to protect them from possible mob violence. It only took a couple months for a grand jury to eventually indict all of them. In February of 1951, two years after they were found guilty, the so-called Martinsville Seven were executed via electrocution. This execution would come down in history as the largest to be performed for rape charges in the entire United States. There have been countless protests and appeals made to question the swift conviction of the suspects. The other glaring matter being pointed out was the rather harsh punishment imposed, considering that rape is a non-lethal crime. In December of 2020, an organization called Martinsville 7 Project asked the present Virginia Governor Ralph Northam to posthumously pardon the seven. Less than a year later, on August 31st, 2021, Northam issued a news release whereby the state pardoned the convicted. The governor did clarify that the pardons are not about whether they were guilty or not. Instead, it served as a recognition from the Commonwealth that these men were tried without adequate due process and received a racially biased death sentence, not similarly applied to white defendants. 
the press release stated. Though this may not fully compensate for the damage that was dealt, it does, somewhat, bring closure and end to the vicious cycle of violence, racial injustice, and inequity that many believe still persists today. Number 1. 1984 Hammer Attack Killer It's quite interesting to know that a simple tool like a hammer can be both an instrument of good and evil. Good, of course, when it's used for what it's intended for, and bad when it's used to harm others. To a man named Alex Ewing, a hammer was his means to exact evil on the lives of his victims. On the night of January 15, 1984, Bruce Bennett and his wife Deborah were at their home in Aurora, Colorado. Living with them were their two daughters, Melissa and Vanessa. Suddenly, the four of them were attacked right inside their own residence. The parents were both brutally killed using a hammer. The eldest daughter was then raped before being murdered. Vanessa, who was only three at the time, fortunately survived her injuries that she incurred during the vicious hammer attack. The consequent investigation led police to believe that these murders shared similarities to the brutal death of a woman named Patricia Smith. Earlier in the month, Smith was found savagely beaten with a hammer. She had also been sexually assaulted, and authorities were able to find DNA evidence that would later link Ewing to the two separate homicide cases. However, it took the police almost 40 years before they could make that connection. Apparently, forensic technology was still limited at the time, but in 2018, new investigators reignited their work on the cold cases and submitted the DNA evidence to the FBI's CODIS database. It was here that they were able to match Ewing's DNA profile to the evidence collected from both crime scenes, and at this point, the man is serving a prison sentence in Nevada for a separate violent crime. Regardless, he was still made to face trial for the 1984 slayings. Now 61 years old, Ewing was found guilty and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences recently in August of 2021. He's expected to be extradited back to Colorado, where he will serve the new set of prison sentences. Despite what many believe to be a relatively mild punishment, the families of the victims, as well as the Aurora community, we're still thankful that the cases were finally solved. The 37 long years didn't mean a thing, now that they know that the person responsible is already locked up for good. So there were the strange and scary mysteries of the month for November of 2021. Every day we encounter strange and baffling stories that most of us don't know what to make of. These are just a handful, but there's still so many more to uncover. If you guys enjoyed this video, then remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell. We have new videos coming out every single week for you guys to check out. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you soon.